Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus once said that a prophet is never welcome in his hometown, and a barely insightful person might add, yes, and also not really anywhere else. Nevertheless, the texts today are broadly about the reception of visitors, with both the Hebrews reading and Luke's gospel providing excellent examples of how it's done. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is being watched. He's being watched by the Pharisees while he eats at one of their houses. And while he's there at the dinner party, Jesus decides to tell the group a parable. This is one of his favorite cocktail hour tricks. The parable, he tells, like most good parables, starts off with a situation common, innocuous, ordinary. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited. There you have it. This is Jesus on good table manners. Maybe he's writing a sort of middle-brow op-ed for the New York Times or something like that. Don't sit at the place of honor because somebody more important than you may be invited, and then you'd have to move. How embarrassing would that be? Thank you, Jesus. Very sensible. I will subscribe to this advice column. Thank you. Instead, sit down at the lowest place at the table so that when your host comes, he might say to you, friend, come up higher. Then you'll be honored in the eyes of all. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. All of a sudden in that last line, we realize that table manners aren't exactly the point, are they? Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves exalted. There are lovely echoes of Our Lady's Magnificat in that line, aren't they? And of the great rearranging to be completed at the end of days. His short parable now finished. Jesus turns again to more practical table advice. At least it sounds that way at first. When you give a feast, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. After all, they might return the favor and then you would be paid back. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And you'll be blessed because they can't repay you you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Can you see the modern ear straining under the weight of Jesus' rationale here? The poor can't repay you, but don't worry about it. You'll get paid back at the resurrection of the righteous. Please, Jesus, just tell us how to be nice. Just tell us about good manners and how to be respectable. Don't tell us about a resurrection and repayment at the end of time. That's so crude. That sounds like a fairy tale. Come now, Jesus, aren't your parables just to help us arrive at a higher state of psychosocial awareness? In a word, no. And good news, too. Jesus will save us from a great many things, among them confusing his teachings for signposts to more interesting stuff. Many of you know that I'm not originally from Dallas. I grew up in the People's Republic of Austin. So I'm, I'm contractually obligated to keep it weird, you understand. I'm not from Dallas, but I spent a few summers coming up here for this or that reason uh, with my home church. Often it was for a mission trip. I guess there were more pagans here in DFW than there were in Austin, I guess. Our church took several trips up here to help out with a particular mission in Arlington. It was a Christian organization whose goals included bringing the church to the people. And so the way that a bunch of teenagers got involved in that was to put on vacation Bible school programs in underserved parts of the community. Ideally, we would go out to these sort of run-down, shabby neighborhoods, invite children to the program, they would say yes, and then the kids who made it would stay out of trouble, play soccer with us, and be intentionally introduced to our Lord Christ. That was sort of the pattern. It was at this mission in the summer after my ninth grade year that I had my first real encounter with a homeless person. I hope to never forget it. Three friends and I 
were on a walk in an unfamiliar, decrepit part of town under heavy summer heat. We had strayed away from our larger group, but we were on our best behavior, minding our own business as teenage boys are wont to do. We were wandering aimlessly when a haggard, shirtless man suddenly approached us, seemingly from nowhere. You could smell him before you could see him. He looked a little rough, a little dangerous. Hey, boys, what are y'all selling? He asked. I really could not have expected what happened next, but knowing how these meetings usually go, I was surprised to learn that the man didn't ask us for food or money. He probably should have. It was plain to see that we were better off than he was, if such things are ever plain. He didn't ask us for money or for food, but he instead gave a gift to us, and the gift was a story. It's hard to overstate how profound and moving his life story was. His story was to us incredible. It was filled with heartbreak, loneliness, oppression, even violence. And it was woven throughout with the echoes of a gospel and of a certain God who time and time again had helped him escape drug addiction and who had led him out of various imprisonments, the ones just and unjust. He was traveling north, hoping, despite himself and his many failures, to be reunited with the woman who would become his wife. In their early days, she had helped, he had helped her keep the needles out of her arm. She had helped him keep the revolvers out of his mouth. And now he was going to go find her again, hoping against hope that many waters had not quenched love. His story shook us to our cores. And for weeks afterward, it was all my friends and I could talk about. We did not know what to do about this guy, this utterly strange homeless person who had reduced a crew of tough teenage boys to weepy, sniveling messes. As the man's story came to a close, he prayed for us. He prayed for us. He gave us the handful of change in his pocket. That belongs to the church, that money, he said. And then he left us that day, mysteriously, in much the same manner as he had arrived. One day we'll see each other again, he said. I'll be waiting for you at Christ's river. I didn't go back to work at the mission the next day. That day or the next day. I did go back to the parking lot where we met him, and I just sat under a tree for several hours the next day just hoping to catch a glimpse of him again. Uh, You have to understand that we were undone by this encounter, wondering about who we had entertained unaware. Our Lord had shown himself to us without our asking in just the brief reception of a visitor. And just sharing a table with him for a brief eternal moment. So people of St. Matthew's, there are two groups of your friends for whom Jesus' words today will simply be unbearable. Two of your friend groups who will find Jesus' words about who to invite to the banquet a little too hard to swallow. Not you, of course, but two groups of your friends. Let's talk about them. Let's call the first group the realists. The realists are very concerned about the presence of the poor in our midst, and not without reason. The poor, say the realists, damage property, leave behind messes, are loud, obnoxious, disrespectful, dangerous. More importantly, most importantly, their presence keeps away the high-profile customers, the ones that we'd really like to sit at the places of honor at the banquet. People of St. Matthew's, for your friends, the realists, the words of Jesus are just too much. But I'm afraid your other group of friends doesn't fare much better either. Not you, of course, but your other group of friends, the benevolent. The benevolent want very much to have the poor in our midst, to a certain degree. They are all too happy to be poor adjacent, so long as somebody else has to deal with them. The benevolent are happy to pat themselves on the back for their benign attitudes so long as they never have to invest any sweat equity. So they'll do as they always have, 
cast their vote for more social safety nets, abstractly imagine the poor as a noble savage, and contribute nothing of personal value in these lives. Both of your friend groups have profoundly missed Jesus' point. Luckily, you aren't among them. You are among those called to Jesus' mission of hospitality and encounter. You were called to entertain stranger and sojourner. You were once sojourners yourself in Egypt. So if you're thinking that has political implications, you're right, but not in the way you expect to be right. Christianity isn't merely the springboard into bigger, more important things. It is itself the thing. Following Jesus doesn't have political implications. It is itself the form of true politics. So at this point, I need to confess something to you. I've never given a dinner and invited people in that I knew couldn't repay me. I've never really followed Jesus in this area of my life. Now, I've never really disobeyed him on this one either, in much the same way that I've never disobeyed him about turning the other cheek. Nobody's ever punched me in the face, you know what I mean? I hope that never happens, but if it does, I will have received the grace to obey Jesus in uncharted territory. At the same time, it's also true that I don't really open myself up such that this opportunity to obey Jesus in uncharted territory becomes possible. What might it mean for me to extend myself in this way? What might it mean to move beyond the silliness, the unbearable silliness of the realists and of the benevolent into actual transformative encounters with people? who cannot benefit me socially. The problem with the Pharisees in today's story is that they act like there are no clear answers to these questions, as if the history of Israel herself had no weight, no bearing. If they were truly children of Abraham, they would do as Abraham did. What did Abraham do? He runs out to meet his visitors, he bows before them, he washes their feet, he makes them food. And in this offering of hospitality to his guests, Abraham gets back more than he ever gives. Behold, your wife Sarah will bear a son. That's the nature of Christian hospitality, folks. We receive more than we give. I've been carrying around the story of that homeless guy for a decade and a half. It's because he gave me more than I gave him. Friends, we're in a time of reimagining what it means to give a banquet here in this local church. How it is that we can best fulfill what St. Paul commands, receive one another as you would Christ. Not because we're nice, Lord knows. Not because we have good table manners. Jesus' premise here is, of course, totally ridiculous unless you buy into the conclusion. When you give a banquet... Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you'll be blessed. Sounds great, Jesus. I like being a humanitarian. I really enjoy being, doing good humanitarian work. Why will I be blessed? How does the blessing work? Because they can't repay you. You'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Okay, Jesus. That's just crazy enough to work. Sign me up. Sign me up to share in one of the happiest paradoxes of the Christian journey, wherein the lines between guests and hosts are blurred, are permeable, wherein we wonder about whom we've rightly entertained unaware. An old hymn puts it like this. Come, risen Lord, and deign to be our guest. Nay, let us be thy guests. The feast is thine.